Right. All right, so I will be talking about coronary uh, engagement, mainly left coronary engagement, whether from radial or uh, femoral. And I will be showing as we go uh, several movies about uh, difficult engagements and how to maneuver in those cases. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me and ask or uh, write them in the chat box, okay? So I will go briefly over in our, over the very basic catheter. This is a Judkins left catheter and the Judkins right. So this catheter, like uh, most catheters, they have two bends, what we call the primary curve and the secondary curve. And the distance between those curves define the size of the catheter. When we say Jotkin's left four, it means we have four centimeters between those two bands. Okay. And we will see the importance of that in a few slides. This is a Jotkin's right catheter, totally different shape, meant to go toward the right coronary artery. Again, it's it has a primary and secondary curve, a different shape overall, but primary and secondary curve. And again, three, four, five centimeter gives you Judkins right three, four, five. In general, for Judkins right, we overwhelmingly use a JR4. With a Judkins left, we use a JL4 mostly, but we can definitely use three, five, six, three point five. I will start by the first uh, clinical tips. So this is a Judkins left four coming from the left femoral and engaging the left coronary. It's very easy to engage the left coronary from a femoral axis using the Judkins system, which is the preferred system for that. Now take that same Judkins left four and use it from right radial. And here you see the first difference between radial and femoral. So I want you, as we go through, to understand a fluoro is a 2D abstract thinking. So you have to imagine how the catheters are going and try to understand the anatomy. Uh, so this is a Judkins left four coming from left radial, uh, from radial. And the first difference you notice is that a radial axis will elongate the catheters and make them point down. So this is the same arm. I drew those and I made sure this is the same length, but when it's coming from radial, it's elongated and it's pointing down. Therefore, in the same patient, if JL4 is good from femoral, it's not good from right radial. So this is how it's coming from right radial. So the question becomes, what catheter, if we're still sticking with the Judkins left system, what catheter will be good from right radial? Or maybe the more important question, each time you see something like this, whether radial or femoral, you see a catheter elongated and pointing down, what's the immediate next step? This is the immediate next step, is you get a shorter arm. So whenever you have a catheter that's elongated and looking down, you get a shorter arm. So this is JL4, you use a JL3 and a half or JL3. So here we use a JL3 and a half and it pointed properly into the left coronary. So that gives you two idea. When, when the catheter is elongated pointing down in any approach, you need a shorter arm catheter. Two from a radial, you do elongate catheters and therefore, you need, in general, if you're using the same Judkins left system, you need a slightly shorter Judkins left to be successful from a radial. It elongates and it makes catheter point down. Now I will mention another tip that's very important. Uh, again, those should be reflexes. So when you have a catheter elongated pointing down, your reflex should be to get a shorter arm from any approach. When you have a catheter that looks to be falling and pointing up. So here it's elongated and pointing down. Now the whole catheter arm, that distance between primary and secondary, the whole thing is falling down and the tip is pointing up. The immediate reflex should be to get a longer catheter. So here you need to go bigger. Here you need to go smaller. It's, it's a simple slide, but it's so important. And this is the illustration. This is a Judkins left four. 
we do, it's elongated. You get a Judkins left 3.5 and you're properly engaged. This is Judkins left four, whether femoral or radial. It's in a patient, old patient with severe hypertension and elongated or large aorta, the whole catheter is falling down and the tip is pointing up, you get a JL5. Or if this was JL3, you get a JL4. So you get a bigger arm catheter, okay? So this is a very important slide to remember for basic fellows, but also more advanced fellows, okay? Now, the next question that comes, I mentioned in my prior slides, I was focusing on right radial. Well, is it much better from left radial? To a degree, but not much better. It's slightly better from left radial. You may get less elongation, but in general, in my experience, it's fairly close. And in general, I also tend to downsize catheters from a left radial. I tend to use the same maneuver from left as from right radial, okay? Uh, all right, this is another important tip. So I highlighted the catheter elongation and the catheter shape difference between radial and femoral. The biggest and maybe most important difference when we're talking radial is this. What radial does compared to femoral, it creates an additional catheter twist at the level of that sharp innominate aorta junction. This creates a catheter tendency to prolapse out of the ascending aorta into the aortic arch and reduces the catheter support because the catheter wants to jump out. It doesn't want to stay there. So you lose some of the catheter support. Left radial may be a little better, but again, I don't think in my experience, it makes a dramatic difference. The advantage of left radial is that you get less loops. In the right radial, you have, you, you have 10 to 15% chance of what we call subclavian and innominate loops, as well as radio, radio ulnar loops. You have statistically less of those, particularly at the subclavian level, less of those from a left radial approach. So that's one advantage of left radial, uh, but overall not dramatically different. Now that caveat I mentioned of poor support and catheter prolapse is particularly true when you see this. So as you're engaging, this is before you inject any dye, you look at your catheter and you see that, that bend, that sharp backward bend, and you see a short aorta. When you see that shape, you have to memorize it well. You see that shape, you know that will be a tough radial engagement. Although with the special tips, you'll be able to engage very successfully and early on but just remember that shape so we adjust accordingly. Sharp bend, short, short aorta, those will be the toughest case, cases for uh, radial engagement, okay? So for that reason, some catheters have been made to be more favorable for a radial approach. So one of them is the Tiger and Jackie family of catheter. The difference between Tiger and Judkins left is that Tiger, is, the Judkins, as I mentioned, has a primary and secondary curve. The Tiger and Jackie, instead of a curve, they have a pla plate, like a plateau here, which allows the catheter to sit on the opposite aorta and be a little more stable, have more supporting force. Uh, another catheter, I think the absolute best catheter from uh, radial access, particularly for the left coronary, is what we call the Icari left catheter. So the Icari left catheter, this one is unfortunately only a guide catheter for intervention, not a diagnostic, although at times in difficult cases, I use it for diagnostic purposes as well. So this is a six French guiding catheter. One, it has a plate, unlike the Jotkins catheter, it has a plate that allows it to sit across the aorta. Two, it has a bend across to sit across the innominate, so it's less likely to prolapse. It doesn't have that natural tendency to prolapse. Three, it's more upward pointing. In general, the catheter itself is more upward pointing than the Jotkins catheter, so which makes it more favorable for uh, radial engagement, uh, for transradial engagement. Okay, and I'll go over more examples. Uh, here is my, I, you know, you can try to remember that slide. This is my personal approach. What are my favorite catheter for diagnostic and guide through femoral or radial? This is a summary slide. So 
diagnostic and even first year fellow need to know that. For femoral, the best system are Judkins left four, and you adjust the size according to how the catheter is sitting. And for RCA, Judkins right four or Amplatz right, which I will go over uh, a little later. For radial, it's Judkins left three and a half or Judkins right AR system. An alternative, so again, for femoral, it's the Judkins system. For radial, you could use the Judkins system, but you can as well use the Tiger Jackie system. Now for guiding catheter, for radial, my preferred is I carry left for the left coronary and for the right coronary, I don't like the Judkins system. I like more support with an amplex left or I carry left actually or right, okay? Uh, there is another set of guide system beside the ICARI, it's called the EBU or XB CLS, which is more favorable for femoral than radial, but can be used in radial. This is the EBU CLS. It really has a generally one bend and a long tip. It's somewhat similar to ICARI, except it doesn't sit as well on the opposite aortic wall as ICARI does. And it doesn't have a bend to sit in the enominate. Okay, so, but it is used by many operator um, instead of the ICARI from radial and it's the preferred from femoral system. Now for all procedures, radial femoral left or right coronary, remember Amplatz left is a great catheter, diagnostic or interventional in all cases when you get in trouble. It's the catheter that provides the most support I'll be, I will go over it uh, later, but mostly in other sessions. So Amplex left can be used for left or right coronary from all axes. It's a great, whenever you're stuck, whether native coronaries or graft, think the next step could be Amplex left. Okay. Any questions uh, so far? Okay. I. I described mainly the left coronary through all this, which is the most difficult coronary to engage from a radial axis. It's the easiest to engage from a femoral axis. Your Judkins left goes straight into the left coronary from a femoral, but it's not easy from a radial axis. Now, regarding the right coronary, the right coronary, this is a Judkins right four that we're using to engage from a femoral. This is from Judkins right four from a radial. Unlike Judkins left, a radial tends to actually shorten and loop JR4. So it elongates the JL4, but because of the curvature, you're looking toward the right side of the aorta, the convex portion of the aorta. So actually you tend to shrink and loop and make it more upward looking than JR4. Therefore, uh, <clears throat> we don't shorten. So Therefore, the catheter that we use from ephemeral GR4 is still good from a radial. If anything, some operator recommended GR5 from a radial to make it more down pointing. Again, because you tend to point up when you're going toward the right coronary. So the bottom line is that for the right coronary, we don't downsize compared to femoral. We use the same catheter because we tend, if anything, to make the catheter point more up as they are looking toward the right side of the aorta. Okay, that is one reason why the tiger catheter, which is, which is meant to engage both the left and the right coronary, is not very favorable, even though we can use it for right coronary, is not very favorable for the right coronary because it tends to point too much up. Okay, it tends to point too much up, particularly that the tiger, the arm of the tiger is a four and the jackie, it's a four. Okay. All right. Uh, so those are basic tips. I'll give a couple more basic tips and then I will start showing some cases, okay? Uh, this is another basic tip for any case, a radial or ephemeral left or right coronary engagement. We always engage typically in an LAO view. This is the aortic arch in an LAO view. This is what opens the LAO arch, the LAO view. Furthermore, the LAO view opens the coronary cusp. So this is an axial cut across the, um, uh, across the uh, base of the aorta, the aortic root. And 
you see how LAO opens the left, right coronary cusp and allows you to aim your catheter to the left coronary or right coronary. RAO will make those um, coronaries looking to you or away from you, not orthogonal to you, and you cannot engage typically in that view, okay? So we use LAO to open the coronary ostia, and uh, this is in an oblique view, and it shows you not just that the LAO opens right and left, it shows you another very important tip as you're engaging, which is that the right cusp is lower than the left cusp. And the non-coronary cusp, which is more uh, posterior, is also the lower most cusp. It's a very, very important one that we use in every case we engage, and I'll mention it in a little bit again. So when your catheter is falling, it's in the right cusp or in the non-coronary cusp. But typically to simplify it, we often consider it in the right cusp. When your catheter jumps up, it's in the left coronary cusp, okay? So imagine right cusp is low, left is high, okay? All right, now how do we engage from a radial axis? Okay, there are two methods of engaging from a radial axis. So we get our catheter and wire into the ascending aorta. We keep the wire in and we make, we maneuver the catheter all the way until it touches the cusp. Typically when you're going from radial, the catheter will tend to fall into the right cusp. Again, the lowermost cusp. Always in your mind, fluoro unfortunately is a lot of imagination. So imagine right cusp and left cusp throughout your engagement. Right cusp is the lower. So you get your, let's say we're using here uh, a tiger catheter or a Jutkin's left. So we get that and we're trying to engage the left coronary. So we get that to the right cusp. It falls in the right cusp. We make it touch it. Then we pull to make it jump into the left cusp. That pull is a very important step. And that jump, we call it, is a very important step. You get on the left cusp. Now, once you get into the left cusp, there are two techniques to get into the left coronary. One technique that works well in diagnostic cases is to just pull and try to jump in the left main. As you're pulling, you react to your catheter. If your catheter is a little out of plane, you may clock or counter clock. And you react, you try to clock slightly. If your catheter turns around as you're clocking, you immediately counter clock. It's usually a subtle torque subtle clock or subtle counter clock. So you pull a little up and if you need a slight torque and you react to how the catheter is behaving. That's the first technique. The second technique is after you jump in the left cusp, you push the catheter and you make it loop up and go from down to up to engage the left coronary. This technique is a better technique for guiding catheters during intervention. It's also the better technique when your catheter is unstable and you have difficult engagement, okay? For a guy like this, the, the sharp and short, this is definitely a case where you cannot engage by just pulling. You just pull to engage. If you just pull to engage the left coronary, your whole system will jump out and fall into the aortic arch. This is a case where you need to use a second technique where you hear, where you push and engage from below. That technique, the pull is a great for this patient, for a patient like this. Long aorta, no sharp angles, catheter stable, it works well. Catheter is unstable or interventions, the best is often to look from below, okay? This is an example here. Again, by looking at fluoro, no, in, no, no contrast here. You see there is a sharp junction and a short aorta. Memorize that picture. When you see this, you know you need a special maneuvers to be successful. Don't waste your time trying to engage from above. Uh, just know what's the immediate next step. The immediate next step is to do this, to engage from below. If the current catheter ca doesn't let you engage from below, switch out. Typically with a tiger catheter, uh, which is like I mentioned here, Tiger is that a special uh, radial catheter. So with a Tiger catheter, it's a little harder, Tiger and Jackie, it's a little harder to loop from below. It is easier with a Judkins left 3.5 uh, 
and it's easier with the Icari left here, this slide. It's easier to loop from below using this one. Again, I'm talking left coronary or using the Icari left than the Tiger system. And I'll show more examples, okay? Uh, so this is a case, a simple case here to illustrate. So this is the catheter. It Look again, it fell into the right cusp. It jumped, then it jumped into, we pulled it to jump in the left cusp. That's the first basic maneuver, okay? This is a tiger catheter. Uh, this is another case. This shows you how to loop from below, okay? So again, you see we jumped. I repeat it here. So we were on right cusp. We jumped into the left cusp. Then we pushed to engage from below, okay? It may not look smooth, but that's how it worked in this case. Uh, again, if it doesn't work with this catheter, let's say this is JL4, it didn't work with it, or Tiger 4, then you downsize. It's easier to loop with a shorter arm Judkins left. So if there's a Tiger 4, get a JL 3.5 to do that looping, okay? if you couldn't engage from above or the catheter is unstable, okay? This is another case in a patient with, again, short aorta. And I place those for you to help you imagine. So this is going to, this is a Jackie catheter. It's going to the right cusp. Here we tried to push and loop from the right cusp, which we generally shouldn't. We should try to jump in the left cusp. And here is what we did. We tried to jump, we jumped in the left cusp, and now we try to loop after we jump in the left cusp. And we were able to engage. Now watch, this patient has a sharp bend across the ascending aorta. And so that's why we aim to try to engage from below. So we're still in the right cusp. We pull. Uh, we get in the left cusp, then we push it to engage, okay? If this didn't work with a Jackie, we will do Judkins left 3.5. Uh, this is here I want to illustrate as another case, but just to show quickly, sometimes it's hard to tell. Here I have it drawn, drawn for you, right, left cusp, but you know, how can you tell? Sometimes it's a little hard. One way of telling, if you give a puff and you see that wedge, you see here, it's subtle puff. You don't see a left coronary. You just see a wedge with no left coronary. That's a hint that you're actually in the right cusp. So this is a right cusp and this is a right cusp ridge, basically. Okay, you know you need to still pull. Even if you think in the left coronary, you see that ridge with no coronary, that means you still need to jump. This is a tiger catheter. See that plate here that I mentioned that makes the catheter more stable. This is another case. I want you to know what's the next step here, just by uh, looking at that picture. So this is a tiger catheter, which has an arm of four. It's in the left cusp, and you see the left coronary in that non-selective puff. It's just above you. So what's the next step here? Can you use a JL 3.5 or shorter? Excellent. Excellent, good answer, yes. So that's so. whenever you see catheter elongated with the tip looking down, the next step is to get JL 3.5. Now, one thing you can try, you can try to see if you can loop it from below. Unlikely to be successful, but try to loop it from below and see if you can reach from below. Unlikely to be successful with this forearm. Even if you loop from below, you probably will need a JL 3.5 anyway. So yes, correct. Try to loop from below with this catheter briefly, doesn't work, get a JL 3.5. And this is a JL, uh, sorry, where, here. This is JL 3.5 in the prior case, uh, successfully engaged, okay? It pointed properly compared to that one. Look at how this one is pointing, okay? This is another similar case, just so your eyes practice again. This is Tiger 4 catheter. It's pointing a little down. 
I will tell you here, yes, you can get a JL 3.5, but frequently here, it's really very close, a little bit of clockwise torque. But again, you react to what you see, a little bit of clockwise and push can flip the catheter and make it pull, push or look a little up. So a little clock torque and advance it may make the catheter engage. It frequently works. Again, you react to what you see. If I'm clockwise torquing and the catheter looks toward this side, I immediately reverse in my first 20, 10, 20 degrees of torque. So I don't lose it, okay? So a lot of time, a little clockwise torque with a push will work. If not, try to push from below. If not, definitely Judkins left 3.5 will engage this. Basically a shorter arm, okay? Uh, this is another case. Uh, this is a Judkins left 3.5. Uh, it's in the same patient actually as before this one. We couldn't engage it with a Tiger, which is four. So we did a Judkins left uh, 3.5 and you see how it pointed properly there. Okay, now it's still not in the coronary, but it's pointing in the right direction. And uh, we kept pushing it after this and we engage from below with a JL 3.5 in this patient. JL 3.5 makes it easier to point in the proper direction in this patient, but also to engage from below, okay? So here's a summary so you to remember. To loop from below, uh, you use a shorter arm, Judkins left 3.5 most often, especially in tight narrow aorta. Another technique I didn't mention is to use the ICARI left or CLS, and I'm going to show those cases. So you use a shorter arm JL 3.5, or you can use ICARI left to loop from below. In this case, for example, ICARI left will have worked well, even though it's a long arm. So you can use a long arm ICARI left just because of the design of the ICARI left. It's more upward pointing here quickly. It's more upward pointing. So even if you use 4, 4.5, it will be looping nicely to look into the coronary. And typically with an ICARI left, I don't use a 3.5. I use around 3.75 to 4.5. And that will be able, actually, I don't like the short one. It's not going to reach because I always loop it from, try to loop it from below. I tend to use higher arm ICARI left. So ICARI left 4, will work for this, especially if you're trying to intervene, uh, okay? So Judkins left, shorter Judkins left, or a normal length I carry left will be most successful to look from below. Tiger and Jackie may work, as I showed here in a case. Um, this case, this was a Jackie and we were able to loop it from below, but it's less often successful. It may work. It works probably better, in my opinion, with six French catheters because they are stiffer and they provide more pushability uh, without tending to prolapse out from the left as you're pushing them. One problem as you're pushing is your catheter prolapse from the left to the right cusp, but six French can give you more stability. Uh, so those are the catheters that work best to engage from below without prolapsing the right cusp those two and probably six French, okay? Yes, this pictures illustrate that concept. All right, and this shows you here a difference in a patient. This is Tiger 4, this is a JL 3.5, this is JL 3. See how the catheter points more and more up as you go lower and how it's easier to make it point up with a shorter arm. Again, with a Judkins Tiger system with a, I carry that doesn't work. A four system will probably engage this better than JL3. Some of those tips are for the more advanced fellows. That's why I mentioned the ICARI and the guiding catheter. Same idea about ICARI applies to other guiding catheter like CLS or EBU system. I would use EBU4 to try to engage from below, um, generally speaking. Okay. So this is a case with ICARI left. So again, we jumped in the left cusp, then we pushed it and engage from below. Uh, so look at it again here, I'll start it. 
So we jump, see always the jump from right to left. Now we're pushing the left cusp to engage from below. We still haven't reached. And sometimes it does this. We don't like that when the catheter loops on itself, it may be a little risky, but unfortunately with radial, we at times have to do this to engage. So you see how we keep pushing, it engages on itself, it loops on itself, you see it? Then in this time we pull. When it looped on itself, it hooked the coronary osseum. Don't, don't inject because you can dissect when it's looped on itself here. They don't inject in this position, just pull and it will fall and be coaxial with the coronary with good support from the controlateral, controlateral aorta. And here, and at that time, you can inject and confirm your position. Okay, you're supported from the opposite aorta and uh, from the cusp, and you're more coaxial, you can inject now. Same procedure, by the way, applies to CLS. You make it jump from right to left, and you push it up to hook the system. Then you may pull to make it coaxial. I do think this provides more support and is more slick, easier to maneuver, more hydrophilic, more flexible. And it has that plate, unlike the CLS or XB EBU system, which is a point. It used to be uh, in the femoral era that if you are engaging the left coronary artery with a Jodkin's left fore, you need to downsize when you are engaging with a guide and get a CLS or EBU 3.5 guide for intervention. This, in my experience, is not true in the radial era. A shorter Jodkin's left arm is needed during radial engagement, for example, 3.5, while a longer Icari left or CLS EBU arm is needed in general. For example, 3.75 to 4.5. This longer arm is needed to sit on the cusp and be looped all the way up from below and reach the ostium. Okay, I'll give you another example here. This is a common situation we encounter. Okay, we engage successfully here with a tiger. But here's what happens. You inject and the catheter keeps popping out. What is the next step here? There is, you don't want to have a coronary angiogram with poor pictures where the catheter keeps popping out. So you have to think of a next step here. So what are the next potential steps? This is Tiger 4. That's one caveat of engaging from above. It's great if you get your pictures well, but if your catheter keeps popping out, one of the first reflexes is, well, I need to engage from below. Engaging from below in a radial axis is the way to get a stable catheter and stable pictures. So you need one possibility is you can change your strategy. So try to engage from below with the same catheter. If it doesn't work, change catheters. That's one technique. Another technique is to try to use six French if you're using five French. I try in men to always start with a six French because I get better pictures and less uh, catheter, uh, you know, pushing out of the coronary during injections. It's a more sturdy, evidently larger catheter, more sturdy, more resistant, better pictures. And you have to inject less hard with a six French. So you can get better pictures. So one technique, six French, another technique, try to push down the same catheter and loop from below, or the third is get another catheter and loop from below, okay? Uh, so always from below is a more stable engagement. And that's what I did here. The same catheter, Tiger 4, we engage from below and we got a very stable injection, okay? Very nice injection. Um, everybody understood this, uh, this technique? Okay, this situation, for example, may be encountered in a lot of cases, but one of the cases is aortic stenosis. Severe hypertension is another one. Large aorta is another one. So those are cases where it's hard to get good pictures and you tend to have that popping catheter. Partly if the downstream pressure is high in hypertension or severe aortic stenosis, 
the LV pressure is high, so it's hard to fill those coronaries. All right. No question, I'll show more tricky cases. Any questions? Okay. So those are tricky cases that I saved. I want you to look at here. So already here, before I play the video, actually, before I play the video, you already see from the wire shape, this will be a tough case. But, you know, before you do anything, he could be a 35 year old man, which, you know, we think as younger people as having uh, easier anatomy for radial, but that's not always the case. He could be a 35 year old man. You see this, you know, it's going to be a tough case. Sharp bend, short aorta. Now I'll show you how to maneuver in those cases. Uh, those are long videos, but you can watch. So one, we try to get, and here is the technique. One question, one, one first question is, if that catheter was going the descending aorta, catheter and wire are in the descending aorta, the first technique, how do we get them to go in the ascending aorta? There are two techniques to get them in the ascending aorta. Uh, the advanced fellows know, but any of the first year fellows? So the first, the technique is one, you advance the wire and catheter all the way in the ascending, descending aorta. You pull the wire back, then you pull your catheter, you, pull, you put them here, then you pull your catheter all the way to the aortic arch, and you do a maneuver. Clockwise or counterclockwise, you need to know it well. It's always the same. It's counterclock. So you pull and you counterclock and it will make the catheter jump in the ascending aorta. Simultaneously to that, you ask the patient to take deep breath. So you ask the patient to, to take a deep breath, which elongates the chest and that junction which, and makes it more favorable to go in the ascending aorta. And you do a counterclock. The catheter jumps in the ascending aorta, then you quickly advance your wire to grab your position. Then you advance the catheter over it, okay? Now here I'm showing you the stage where we get out of the descending aorta, we reach the ascending aorta, but we're having trouble tracking that catheter into the ascending aorta. Okay, so it tends, as we're trying to track it, it tends to prolapse out because of that very sharp bend, okay? So what do you do here? Again, say one thing to do is to ask the patient to take a deep breath, to elongate this. And as he's taking a deep breath, you push the catheter so it doesn't prolapse out, okay? Simultaneously, you maneuver your catheter. You see, as you're pushing, that catheter is pointing too much out. And it's, you know, uh, it's, you have to make it embrace the inner curvature here. Okay, so as you, you ask him to take a deep breath, and this time you clockwise, so you counterclock to get in the ascending, but then you clock to embrace that ascending and go into the inner curvature of the aorta. And here I'll show you what we did. So that's what you did. You asked him to take a deep breath that elongated that aorta to a degree, and we clockwise thought the catheter, and eventually we got down. We got down to the right cusp, but that's just the beginning, okay? Uh, now we have to get to the left cusp and try to engage, okay? So this is what we try to do on this image. So we have it, it's on the right cusp. Now we don't want to lose that position. We try to jump in the left cusp, but notice every time I try to jump, the whole catheter will jump out. So what we did, we did something not usual, but it's useful in those extreme cases. We try to loop it from the right cusp. So in this case, I failed to make it jump. So I just pushed it from the right cusp and we were able to engage a very stable engagement. Actually, we were able to get very good pictures from the right cusp. I used a six French JL 3.5 in this case, and that's what was successful. Again, another option would have been I carry left 375 or four, something in that range. And you can push it from the right cusp. Those are not usual cases, but this is a case of such because it's an extremely difficult one. Okay. All right, everybody understood this? 
those more advanced tips are for the more advanced fellows for you, okay? That's the point I'm showing it. This is the prior patient. We got a decent engagement with very good angiogram, okay? And a stable catheter. That's another one of those tough cases. So I want to show you here. Um, again, so the catheter, we're advancing it. It's popping out every time we advance it. So we ask the patient to take a deep breath and we clock the catheter to try to embrace that curvature, the inner side of the curvature. We got on the right cusp. Okay, now we go here. So we got on the right cusp. How do I get in the coronary? You can try to make a jump. And in such an extreme case, sometimes I just try to loop it from the right cusp and see if that works. And in this case, it did work. This one actually was a Jackie 4, Jackie 4 catheter. The prior case was GL 3.5, which is more likely to be successful. But this was here a Jackie 4 catheter, six French Jackie 4. Okay. All right. Everybody understood? This is the same patient as that prior slide. Now we decided to intervene on that patient. So I had to redo the, this using an Icari left this time. Again, I did the same thing. Look at that, look at that nice plate in the Icari left, okay? Unlike the CLS EBU system. That nice plate that sits at the opposite aorta and gives you good support. So I use an Icari left here, 3.75, and I pushed it from the right cusp. We're still in the right cusp. You see that puff I gave here? It shows me, I'm still, it shows a ridge. I don't see the left coronary, I'm still in the right cusp. But I kept pushing from the right cusp and we were able to engage the left coronary eventually here. I did not pull and jump here because as I said, it's a difficult case and the catheter would prolapse every time we jump. And here we were able to engage. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. I'll show more cases. This one is an easy case. This is a femoral case. I want you to know, no contrast injection, just by looking at this, this is a more basic idea now that I mentioned earlier, just by looking at this, what's the next step? What catheter should you use? Even before contrast injection, I know I'm not going to be able to engage the left coronary here. So what catheter should I use to engage the left coronary here? Don't JL waste too much time. time. Excellent, JL 3.5. And here, this is a case, and you can tell by giving the puff, you don't need to give a puff, but you can tell you're pointing way too much down, the coronary is above you, get JL 3.5, it's very nicely engaged. Now, this is another one. This is a JL 4 here. What is the next step? Is JL 5, okay, it's simple. This catheter, unlike this, this one is elongating, elongated looking down, this one is falling down, pointing up. This shape, just, you see it, reflex, should be JL5. This is the exact shape, JL4, JL5, regardless of your approach, okay? If no questions, I'll keep going here. I have this interesting case. Uh, so look at the film. This is a guy clearly with uh, bypasses. We're engaging the left main here from a femoral axis. You see the descending aortic catheter. So we're filling the circ and the circ is filling retrogradely a vein graft, okay? So he has a vein graft to the OM. But the important thing on this view, I only see the circ. Where is the LAD? Uh, I want to mention to you that in this patient, it's known that the LED is not occluded. And actually he doesn't have a graft to the LED. He has a graft to the diagonal and graft to the OM and RCA. So his LED is not likely to be occluded. So when you see this, your immediate reflex is, where is the LED? Is it occluded or am I selective in the circ? And that is what our thought here. We are selective in the circumflex. 
So the question is, so before you assume all the LAD is occluded in this bypass patient, think twice, he doesn't have an LAD graft. Before uh, dooming him, just think, well, maybe I need to get into that LAD. I'm just selective into left circumflex. So the question now becomes how to get from a circumflex to the LAD. In cases where you have a very short left main or you have separate left, left LAD and left circumflex ostia, how to get from a circ to the LAD with your catheter? Anybody knows? One, if let's me give you that tip. If you're changing catheter, let's say this is a JL4 uh, and you want to change catheter, what catheter would be best to engage the LAD? Shorter catheter. Shorter catheter, excellent answer. LAD is pointing more up, circumflex is pointing more down. So we to go to the LAD, you get a catheter pointing more up. So if this is a JL4, you may use a JL3 or 3.5, okay? The opposite is true to go from LAD to CERC. LAD to CERC, you get a bigger catheter, okay? Uh, now, what's another technique? So this is the best technique is to change catheter. What's another technique? If you want to try to maneuver it, I'm going to tell you that in this case, this was actually JL3. So we, are, we already went as short as we can on the Jutkins system. Jutkins left three. So how to try to maneuver it with a torquing maneuver to get from CERT to LAD before you try to switch catheters? Is it clock or counter clock to go from circumflex to LAD? Clock it. All right. So it is a little difficult. It is a counter clock actually, but I'll explain it here. It's, it's not intuitive. We all know, and I'll mention it uh, in the next talk about a right coronary artery, that to engage the right coronary artery, we need to clock the catheter. The Jutkins right, you clock it, you go from here to the to more anterior to the right, okay? So you may, but the problem is what applies to the Jutkins right doesn't apply to the Jutkins left. For the Jutkins left, if you clock it, it's not going to go this way. It will go, it's not going to go more anterior. It will go more posterior when you clock it, okay? Because of this difference, the Jutkins left has a hinge. So when you clock it, that hinge makes it go posterior rather than anterior in the case of JR4, which has no hinge, okay? So clocking the Jutkins left or the Tiger in this case, will make it go more posterior. Now, if we're trying to go from a circ to LAD, we're trying to go posterior to anterior. LAD is pointing more up, but it's also more anterior than the circ. So in that case, you have to counter clock. So it's easy in order to remember it, just remember what you do with the JR4 and think opposite. So to go more anterior with JR4, you clock. Well, in this case, counter clock. Keep in mind, there is a big caveat. It doesn't always work. It only works if that catheter has a hinge on the aorta. If it doesn't have a hinge, if the aorta is larger or elongated, then the Jutkins left will behave like a Jutkins right. So your answer clock may work. Just my immediate next step is usually to counter clock with a Jutkins left to go more anterior. Then I can try. If I see it's sending me posteriorly, then I try to clock. Then the next step is to switch to shorter catheter if you can. The ultimate step, if everything fails, is to use amplets left because it points more up. And I'll show that, okay? So this is a case, uh, another, um, this is a patient, the same patient I showed here earlier, okay? So we use the same catheter, which is very short already, JL3. We counterclocked. We pulled this slightly because you want to get out of the cert to get into the LED and we counter clock and it's, it's working with the puff. We see we're going in the right direction. And I counter clocked furthermore and we got well into that LED selectively, okay? All right, this is another case here. Um, this is a case where the tiger wasn't working. So we got a JL uh, 3.5. 
Now the problem is that in that patient, the this is a so we got the tiger. This is a different case. So tiger couldn't engage. We got the JL 3.5. It engaged successfully. Unfortunately, the JL 3.5 went into the circumflex. Now, this is a patient before some may think, well, the LED is occluded. Well, before you assume the LED is occluded, again, make sure you're not non-select, make sure you're not selective in the cert. Make sure there are no separate ostia. I see absolutely no collaterals. So we probably do have an LED that we need to engage, separate ostium. So this is a JL 3.5. Uh, we tried to do some counterclock maneuver. It didn't work. We tried to uh, switch to JL3 to point the catheter more up. It didn't work. This is a JL3. When I tried to engage with the JL3 from above, it went into the circ, like the JL3.5. When I tried to loop it from below, it wasn't reaching. So now what's the next step? Remember what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, whenever you're uh, stuck in a dilemma, the next catheter to think of is MPLATS left, in whether right or left coronary, whether coronary anomalies or graft, MPLATS left. This is how MPLATS left looks like. It's a duck-shaped catheter, okay? It has a, what characterizes it is that big butt. It has a big butt that sits on the aortic cusp and the opposite aorta, and that's what makes it special. It, pro, it, it allows it to get a lot of support by sitting robustly on that aorta with that heavy butt. So look at this. Now, when we say AL1, 2, 3, the butt is the same. The only thing, difference between Amplatz left one, two, three is that distance between the butt and the primary curve, okay? But the butt is the same. So, and this is how we maneuver the Amplatz left. It's not an easy catheter to maneuver. You eventually want it to look like this, like a, like a, a you know, a, what we call it, like a duck pointing into the coronary, sitting on the valve. But initially it comes in elongated, you aim it, you make it jump from right to left. Let's say we're engaging the left coronary. You, you aim it toward the proper cusp, whether right cusp for the right coronary or left cusp for the left coronary. In this case, we're aiming for the left coronary. So we make a jump into the left cusp. Then we push to make it embrace the duck shape. Then after it catches the coronary, we pull and it will dive further more into that coronary. Okay. Uh, Amplats, and, and you may do some clock maneuvers during that, to, you know, to aim it to where you want clock or counter clock to aim it anteriorly, counter clock to aim it posteriorly. It kind of behaves like a Judkins right in that regard uh, in the torquing uh, process. So Amplats left though, that's an interesting thing. The longer the tip, the more it points up. Unlike uh, the Judkins system here, the Jutkins, the longer it is, the more it points down. The Amplats, the longer that tip, the more it points up. So basically that's important to know because here I'm trying to point very much up. I tried the Jutkins left three, it didn't work. I want to try Amplats left. Well, don't try a short Amplats left. You need to try a long Amplats left, the longer you have. We tried in this patient Amplats left two. That was the one available to us. It comes in Amplats left three but we tried an Amblatt's left too. So notice initially we hooked that tip onto the left cusp. Okay, then we pushed from the left cusp. The butt usually sits on the right cusp while the tip is on the left cusp if we're aiming for the left coronary. So we hooked the left cusp and we pushed it. Unfortunately, AL2 did not reach. The next step is to get AL3 which we probably should have tried up front. It wasn't available that day. So here I use another catheter that has a long reach that I can loop from below and make it point up. I used Icari left 4.5. You can also use CLS or EBU 4.5. And here I show you the maneuvering. So this is the EBU. I made it jump into the left cusp. Then after I jumped it in the left cusp, we push and made it catch 
that left coronary. Then after that, we pulled it to uh, make it a little more coaxial. Interesting that patient had a tight osteal LAD, okay? We were a little non-selective, so we didn't get ventricular eyes on our tracing, but it was a tight osseal LED. Everybody got this? All right. I am going to give in another talk, the right coronary artery. All I talked today was overwhelmingly left coronary artery and left coronary maneuvering. I will just mention the beginning of the right coronary engagement, uh, just to give you an idea. Uh, the way we engage, from a radial, the right coronary. So we started with the left coronary, let's say with a tiger catheter, and we engage the left coronary. Generally with radial, we can use the same catheter to engage the right coronary, especially if you're using tiger or jacking. So you can use the same catheter. You can choose to also exchange from tiger or Jutkins left to a Jutkins right or Amplax right to engage the right coronary. But let me tell, describe you the maneuver with the one catheter. So here we engage the left coronary with a tiger catheter. How do we get to the right coronary? See, I have it. So what you do, you pull it out of the left coronary. You pull out the tiger of the left coronary. Then you make it, after you pull it out, you make it look straight at you and you push it back down to jump back into the right cusp, which it likes to fall into. And after it falls into the right cusp, it fell here in the right cusp. Then I pull with a clockwise torque to engage the right coronary, okay? Here is the case. Uh, here is how, uh, okay? So you pull with a clockwise torque and to get on the right coronary. One issue with radial, is the RCA is a little easier to engage than from femoral and you don't need to pull too much. You need to clock and pull a little bit. With femoral, you need to pull a lot. The catheter tends to dive when you're engaging the right coronary artery from a femoral. With radial, you only need to pull a little bit. The biggest mistake fellows do when engaging the right coronary artery from a radial is that again, you go to the valve, you go, you touch the valve. Then here, all you need to do is pull and clock. The biggest mistake they do from radial is that they pull too much. The biggest mistake they do from femoral is that they don't pull enough and they don't coordinate well the clock torque and the pull. So here, this is how you know you pull too much. If you inject and you see the convexity of the aorta, you're already too high. You're above the coronary, um, the sinus of Valsalva, coronary cusp. So you see the convexity, you're already too high, okay? And you have to kind of imagine in your mind from the shape of the aorta where the coronary artery will be. The coronary artery in somebody with an elongated aorta like this one, the RCA is not going to be here. It's going to be here on a horizontal portion of the aorta. So the more elongated and horizontal the aorta is, the more that right coronary will be uh, more proximal than you inherently or reflectively think, okay? So keep in mind that from right radial or radial in general, you often tend to pull the catheter too much. When you see the convexity, you're already too high. In this patient, if you pull aiming for here, you're already too high. You should aim for this part of the coronary, okay? for this part of the aorta, I mean, the coronary sinus. And the catheter shape, you have to draw it in your mind using the catheter shape. All right, I'm going to stop here. And next talk, I'm going to give you uh, more tips regarding, regarding the right coronary. Um, and I will give at another time also the uh, grafts engagement.